Good morning to you guys. And it's good to see all of you. Good gracious, man, you're out there looking all bright, shiny, and happy. There's, today's gonna be a lot. And so I'm ready to remind you, to warn you, trying to get you ready um, to put on your thinking cap, to put your jogging shoes on. Uh, it may not be what you expected when you came to church on Sunday morning, but I feel like there's just so much going on in the world that it's important for us to talk about it. So it's gonna be a lot. Did I say that already? Yeah, okay, and so you say, yeah, a lot, a lot. No, it's gonna be a lot. And I have a lot written down for you. And what we're gonna be talking about today is a little prophecy, it's a little current event and it's a little bit um, history. And I have notes that I've prepared for you in your app that have scripture with everything that I'm gonna say today. And the notes are hyperlinked to where you can just go click on the scripture. It'll bring up the, the passage in scripture so you can read and you can follow along. But I wanna make sure you track with me. Now you may just wanna listen today and you may wanna go back and look at your notes later, but I encourage you to look at your notes because what I say is gonna be a lot. Now, for some of you, you know it all. I mean, you, are, you know uh, current events, you know your history, you know your Bible and your theology, but for the rest of us, there's a lot of questions that we ask during times like today. You cannot open a news app, you cannot look at uh, any TV news channel without seeing the conflict in Israel, what's going on in the Gaza Strip, there are uh, weapons, there's war, there's murder, there's killing, there are bombs. I mean, everything you could imagine. And there's sides and there's sides to choose. And I've had so many friends ask me questions about why should we be concerned about Israel? It's way over there, we're way over here. I know the Bible says something about Israel. I've had friends say, why does the world hate Israel? Because it just seems so confusing to see rallies and all kinds of strong opinions. And I just wanna talk about it a little bit today. And so I want to start off with Matthew chapter 24 and take you to a passage that's called the Olivet, or it's from the Olivet Discourse. The Olivet Discourse was the last sermon that Jesus preached, which is an important sermon. It was the last time that Jesus was going to address a large crowd. And it's called the Olivet Discourse. Jesus didn't call it that. Um, we call it that because he preached from the Mount of Olives. And as he was at the Mount of Olives and he was teaching, the theme of his message was very simple. I'm fed up with the, Jew, with the Jewish people, with the leaders particularly. And he pronounced a curse on Israel. And he said, you've messed up religion past the point where I recognize it. God, the father certainly doesn't recognize it. You say you work for us, but you don't. You work for yourselves and um, good luck. It's too late for you. It was a very, very hardcore curse that he placed on Israel. And it was found in Matthew chapter 24 and Matthew chapter 25 and two other places in the New Testament as well. But then he said to his disciples, but don't worry, I'm gonna come back. And when I come back, I'm gonna fix it. Now his disciples were, they were tracking, they were trying to pay attention. And as Jesus was saying that Israel was gonna be cursed, he was talking about a time of testing. He was talking about his coming again. He was talking about all these things he was alluding to. And the disciples are like your kids. Anybody have kids in here or have had kids? You tell a kid something, they expect it to happen right now. Now, some of us adults are like that, but especially children. The disciples were like children with Jesus. He would say something and they're like, all right, that's gonna happen now. He would say, I'm coming again. They're like, okay. When he went you know, to the market and whatever, they're like, okay, he's coming again. When he said, I'm gonna go prepare a place for you, then I'm gonna come back and get you. They're like, all right, Jesus, see you tomorrow. And they did not understand what he was talking about. They thought it would be immediate. And so Jesus was trying to explain to them, he was gonna come again. He was gonna fix something, everything, and that it was going to be in the future and that it was going to take a while. Now, Jesus has not yet come again, but he's going to come again soon. And it could be sooner than we think, but it's certainly sooner than it was yesterday or last month, last year or 2000 years ago. And in Matthew 24, Jesus gave them some signs of the times, the end times. It's gonna be a lot to pay attention to. So buckle up and let's get started. Here we go. Jesus said, watch out for one who deceives you. Now there've been many people who've come saying they were Jesus, saying they spoke for Jesus who weren't really Jesus. You've probably seen some on TV or read about them. He said, I'm the true Messiah and they're gonna be deceivers. He said, you'll hear rumors of wars. And you may say, well, there are always wars, Jesus. We hear rumors of war and there've been wars for thousands of years. And then see to it that you're not alarmed, he said. Such things must happen but the end is still to come. And then he goes on. 
The nation will rise against nation. And we're like, yeah, we've seen that, Jesus. And kingdom against kingdom, there'll be famines and earthquakes in various places. And all of these are the beginning of the birth pains. Very foreshadowing, very foreboding. He had just cursed Israel, but then said he was coming to restore Israel, the Jewish people. That there would be false teachers, that there would be wars and rumors of war, that there would be famines and pandemics and natural disasters. And we say, well, we see those. We have those. They seem to be happening more often and more often. And Jesus said, yes, they're going to continue to happen with more and more frequency, with more and more intensity until the world cannot survive them unless I do something. And he explained what it was going to look like. And then the apostle Paul completed many of the explanations. And it was based on prophecy found in places like Ezekiel 37 and 8 and Zechariah and the book of Daniel and Revelation. And all these scriptures are in your notes, but it all begins with Israel. It began with Israel. The first mention of Israel called Salem back in the day of Abraham. You read about Jerusalem, how important Jerusalem was with the life of David. The Bible tells us in Zechariah that Israel would be a heavy stone, that it would be kicked around, that it would be a weight around the neck of those who were around it, that the Bible tells us Israel would be restored and then defeated and restored and then defeated and, and dispersed and then regathered and that it would continue for years and years and years. And we see throughout the years that that in fact has happened. But everything began with the nation of Israel, Jerusalem, the geographic center, the spiritual center, the place where scripture and the story of the Jewish people in the Old Testament came to fruition and flourished, the place where Jesus worshiped and hung out. It all started with Israel. And the Bible tells us that it will all end with Israel but when we look at the history of Israel, we see that many times there were nations that tried to destroy it. Now, you may know your history. You may know that Egypt back in the day with Moses, they had Israel, they had all the Jews captive and they tried to kill them, persecute them. And God sent Moses to let his people go. Remember that story? Well, that was clearly before the time of Jesus, but it was important. And then a little while later, you see the Babylonians with some friends, they came and they held all the Egyptians cap or all the Israelites captive and tried to destroy the nation. And then a little while later in the time of Christ, you see Rome persecuting the Jews and, and having them sort of under their thumb. And it happened over and over and over again to where we even see as the Israelites, the Jewish people were trying to gain traction, to gain a nation, to regather the Holocaust where 6 million Jews were killed by Germans, by Nazis. And then a few years later, we see one of the most significant events in all of history. Could this be part of Jesus regathering? Could this be a sign that the birth pains have begun? Because when a woman goes into labor, and I've never been in labor, in case you're wondering, um, it starts with a contraction. And they get worse, right? I'm not looking at you, I'm looking at the ladies behind you, yeah. And then they continue to get worse until pretty soon they're so bad that something's gotta happen or the baby comes. And so the contractions begin. And we see this battle in 1948 where an outnumbered group of Jewish people were surrounded by 40 million Arabs who did not want them there, trying to destroy them, to drive them 150 miles into the sea, decide it was time to take a stand. They were going to become a nation with geographic boundaries recognized by the rest of the world. They were outgunned, they were outnumbered. History tells us that they took Volkswagen bugs and school buses and painted them like tanks. They took broom handles, sticks, and painted them like guns, stuck them out the windows so that they could look like they had more force than they did. They were so outgunned and undermanned that Israel, known as the beekeeping nation, used bees to gain a tactical advantage over one of the neighboring nations who attacked. They put beehives all throughout the landscape where they were going to attack, where they were going to, to do battle. And the bees themselves stung their enemies to the point where the enemies had so many bees around them that they dropped their weapons. They ran back home and the Jewish people picked up the guns, met different enemies on a different 
front, now having weapons, still being outnumbered 650,000 to 40 million, insurmountable odds. But this time they fought with weapons that still weren't enough. And arguably God brought a sickness on the enemies of the nation of Israel by way of diarrhea and throwing up. That's a terrible sickness, isn't it? Dysentery, where the enemies of the nation of Israel were so sick they couldn't fight. And Israel, the Jews won a great battle that day. Story after story after a story ultimately becoming a nation in 1948 regathering, being recognized first by the U.S. government and then by others, but still fractured, only occupying part of the city of Jerusalem, which was the center or the capital, in many senses, the point. So a few years later, another war, 1967, called the Six-Day War, where the Jews went to war against about six other nations, Jordan, Syria, Palestine, and Egypt had a part in it. And through this battle, again, miraculously, gaining more geographic territory that included the eastern side of Jerusalem, the Gaza Strip, the Golan Heights, some other areas that are significant. And finally, the nation of Israel in 1967 had the capital city, the city that Jesus considered significant, the city that God named, back under their power and control. But no one knows why they negotiated with the, the Muslim nations that had a significant tie to the city of Jerusalem because on the temple grounds, on the temple mount, the Muslim nations had built their own shrine. You might've heard of the Dome of the Rock. They believed that it had significance to them and their religion. They believed the prophet Muhammad had journeyed supernaturally to Jerusalem, to the top of the rock, the very highest point of the tallest mountain there, the Temple Mount, that he was transformed or transcended or transported into heaven where he met with God and the prophets. And for years and years and years, the Muslims prayed toward Jerusalem before they prayed toward Mecca. And so they've formed this compromise, the Jewish nation, with the surrounding Muslim nations, Palestinians particularly, saying, we'll kind of split Jerusalem, we'll split the temple grounds, we'll split the significance, the spiritual significance. We have the West Wall and you can have the Dome of the Rock, you take care of yours, we'll take care of ours. But neither believe the other should be there. And for some reason, the world began to hate Israel. Now the Bible said it was gonna happen that Israel was gonna be a pain in the neck for the nations surrounding, that it was gonna continually be in turmoil, that it would rise and be obedient and fall and be scattered. But some reason, for some reason, the anti-Semitic feelings were just so pervasive that they consumed many Americans and much of the world. You may wonder why. Well, there are at least three reasons. The first reason is the Palestinians, particularly Hamas, didn't believe they should be there in the first place because it was area that they had historically inhabited. And they were evicted, not only from their homes, but from their religious significant landmark relic, an important area. We don't have landmark significant religious important areas in our, in our faith, but they do. And they vehemently believe that the geographic boundary that Israel created and said was theirs was just simply a line on paper. And even the Quran says, that anyone who lives within a territory like Israel, not a person in the military or in the government, but any citizen, because they participate in the democracy, which is the way of government that's counter to the Muslim faith and tradition, is also considered an enemy combatant. And you can kill them without any consequence or concern. There's a hatred that goes back for generations, generations and generations and thousands of years. And we can't understand it. We don't know what it's like to be displaced. We don't know what it's like to be attacked. We don't know what it's like to be kidnapped. We don't know what it's like to have friends and family 
held for ransom or used as human shields. We have no idea on both sides of the geographic boundary, on both sides of the war. Terrible carnage, unbelievable human misery. We don't have any idea. The second reason the world hates Israel. Universities began, it came out of Marxism, to teach something called critical theory. And I told you it would be a lot. Just stay with me. The second half's a lot more fun. Critical theory. You may not know what it is. I'll tell you what it is. Critical theory is a philosophy, a way of thinking, came out of Marxism. Many, many universities, Harvard, you see all these protests right now against Israel, Columbia, all these academics who are so upset, who are anti-Semitic, who are saying things, terrible things about Israel. Critical theory says that if you happen to be part of a group that's oppressing, you're guilty of the oppression and should be treated as the oppressor. So if you happen to be part of the nation of Israel, they view Israel as being an oppressor, occupying Palestine. They shouldn't be there, that we should hate them, that they should be punished just like the people who actually did it in the first place. So you know why the Palestinians hate Israel, or Palestinians. Secondly, you know why many Americans and Europeans seem to hate Israel. But where the rubber really hits the road, from a prophecy perspective, from a Are we in the end times perspective? From uh, in seven years, are we gonna see Jesus face to face perspective? Is the interest that Iran seems to have in the conflict? Now I'm not a conspiracy theorist and I'm not an end of the world guy and I never will throw my hands up and run around saying the sky is falling. I'm not telling you we're there. I'm just telling you it has my attention and it should have yours. And I'm not trying to scare you because what did Jesus say in Matthew 24? He said, don't be afraid, don't be alarmed. It's gonna happen, but I got your back. Iran has a religion that's been emerging there, an offshoot of the Muslim belief system that's called Mahdism. And they have a Messiah named Mahdi who's supposed to come again and liberate and free Iran spiritually and from their oppressors. And they believe vehemently and wholeheartedly that the only way that Mahdi is going to come and liberate them is when Israel is wiped off the face of the earth, when they no longer exist, and they were simply just a comma or a semicolon in the narrative of history. And we go back to Jesus' words when Jesus says, Israel, you're cursed because you have made it a mess but I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna fix it. And don't be afraid as things seem to get worse and worse and worse because I'm in control. And eventually things are gonna get better. Now, that was the easy part. That was, was, that's just background, that's the history. We're gonna get to the prophetic part, to the biblical part, to the could you and I really be ready to experience the end times part in just a few minutes. Before we do that, I'm gonna show you a quick video put out by one of the leaders of an organization called Jews for Jesus. And you may know that the Jewish people still have not as a group recognized the Messiah, Jesus Christ as their Lord, which means that the Jewish people are not per se Christian at all. And many of them are dying by the thousands as are many Palestinians and others who are fighting right now in that region. And he's gonna ask us to pray for peace in Israel. And you may ask, which is a fair question, why should I pray for peace in Israel? Well, I'm gonna show you in the second half of our time together why biblically and prophetically we should care. But let me just say this right now The reason we pray for peace in Israel is because God told us to. He loves Israel. They are his chosen people. And as he plans to regather Israel and us, the church, in Psalm 122, God himself, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, said, pray for the peace of Israel. So I'm gonna show this video. You're gonna follow along. It's about a minute long. And then we're just going to have a time of worship where we sing like we always do as a church family. And um, I'm going to have some friends up here in the front. And the reason that they're up here in the front 
is to pray with you if you have anything going on in your life, if you have a burden that you're bearing, if you have a concern that, uh, that you have, if you have something that um, someone else in your life is dealing with and you just wanna come and talk to somebody and have them pray for you. There's power in prayer. And there's just something special about sharing a burden with someone else. And so the people who are up here are folks who I asked to pray for me. And I wanna encourage you to come and do that. If you have a prayer request that you would like for us to, to track during the week, to pray for, to follow up with you if you want, you can fill out the card in the seat back in front of you and drop it in the offering box on your way out. We have a prayer team who prays all week long for those things that you may need. If you're joining with us online, we pray for you as well. And we take those requests seriously. And right now there'll be a link for you to text your prayer request. God changes things many times through prayer, but he always changes people through prayer. And so we're gonna watch this video. Our worship team's gonna come. My friends will be here in the front. We're all gonna stand and sing. And then in just a few minutes, I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna really bring this together. And I hope it's gonna be interesting, inspiring, but particularly motivating because we have to live a different way. Hi, I'm Aaron Abramson, Director of Operations with Jews for Jesus. I'd like to call on you, our church partner, to stand with us and pray for the people of Israel today. We know that there are families mourning the loss of loved ones. There are hostages that have still yet to be returned. And so we pray for the safety of the people of Israel. We pray for the de-escalation of what's happening up north as Lebanon and Syria have been entering into the conflict. And we ask that you pray for our teams that are on the ground, Israelis that have been called up to serve and, and to defend their country. Pray for their families as the husbands leave home and pray for the ones who remain as they continue to reach out to those in need. We've set up a distribution center out of our office in Tel Aviv where we're meeting basic needs, providing uh, food and clothing and other supplies that people can't get. And so we just ask that you'd stand with us at this time and pray that the God of peace, that the Prince of peace, would be working in the hearts because we know the death toll is immense on both sides. And so we need God to do a miracle at this time. Thank you so much. All right. So Israel is a storm center. And the Bible says that it will be and has been until it becomes the peace center. And then the Bible tells us it will become the glory center. And that's where it will remain. Now, I want to remind you that all the biblical references are in your notes on the PDF, and this is systematic theology. Um, if we had all the scriptures on the screen, it would be confusing. I just want you to listen to the narrative, and then I'd like you to go home, and I'd like you to look at this and read this for yourself and study, because some of the things I'm going to talk about will require you to form an opinion. Now, we are experiencing birth pains for the coming of Jesus. It's weird to think about it like that. Some labors are long. My wife had a 26 hour labor with my first son, Richard, whose head was as big as it is now when he was a baby and he's 28 years old. Um, and she thought it would never end. So I don't know if we are in the end times or not, as far as like tomorrow's when it all begins, but it has my attention and I'm not a fear monger. And I believe we have been in the end time since Jesus ascended into heaven. And I certainly am not trying to be controversial to build a crowd. I don't have any interest in writing a book, but there are some things that have my attention because even though the Bible tells us the New Testament that Jesus will come again, like a thief in the night, unexpectedly, and that only the father knows the day and the hour, there are some things that will happen before he comes again. There's some signs of the times, as Jesus mentioned, false prophets becoming falser and more prevalent, wars and rumors of war, nations stacking against nations, famines, pandemics, natural disasters, so on and so forth. But there's one sign in particular that, that I think is really significant right now. Now, we're just, we're just looking, we're just watching. We're looking at current events through the eyes of scripture because that's the only source of truth we have. You cannot trust any news network at all. All of them give you a slant. You just pick the slant you prefer and you go from there. If we look at scripture and understand it, there is no slant. 
It will accurately predict the future and the things we need to understand as well as it has accurately told about the things we now see as past. But in Ezekiel 38 and 39, there's a battle that's talked about called the battle between Gog and Magog. And it sounds like something from Harry Potter or some of those books, movies I've never watched or read. I think I saw Harry Potter. It was the Lord of the Rings I fell asleep in, but it sounds like one of those, right? Gog and Magog. I know I lost half of you right there. I'm not listening to a preacher who won't watch Lord of the Rings. Um, just forget I said that. I apologize. How about that? The battle between Gog and Magog. Who are Gog and Magog? Well, many historians and theologians believe that Gog is Iran. A lot of evidence to support that. Probably. Magog, who is that? Well, many, fewer, but many theologians and historians believe that Magog is Russia. We don't know for sure. Possible to tell. Looks like it could be. If Gog and Magog are Iran and Russia, we already know that Iran hates Israel. There already have been ties that as far as I'm concerned are irrefutable to Iran's funding of the terrorist attacks through the Gaza Strip into Israel. And the US just released $6 billion that we're trying to take back, but without much success, it's possibly aid in that. There's also a cooperative alliance between Russia and Iran. They call it a military cooperation that as far as I know has only happened now and hasn't happened to this extent and in this way in the past. Interesting. Now, I don't run around with my arms in the air saying the sky is falling, right? The end is here. I say it has my attention because if you look at the news tomorrow and you see Israel and Russia attack, or excuse me, Russia and Iran attack Israel, then we all have to really, really be paying attention. Because I would say instead of it being possible, it could be likely that we are entering the tribulation period. Now, some theologians believe the battle between Gog and Magog is the last thing that will happen before the tribulation. Most theologians believe that it's the first event that happens during the tribulation. And you may say, what's the tribulation? And if you say it, I'm glad you asked because it's a seven year period that scripture talks about over and over that's very defined and very significant. But before we get there, you have to make a decision if you haven't already about whether you think you're even gonna be here. Now, I'm gonna run over and grab this stool for demonstration purposes, and I run off camera, so I apologize for those of you who are following online. I have these little tape marks on the stage, and I'm really not supposed to go, go there, but you can't keep me in a, in a cage for long, I suppose. So you have to choose um, which side you're gonna go on. Now, you have two schools of thought. You have a person who believes that the rapture, that Jesus Christ, will come again like a thief in the night, unexpectedly, before the tribulation. They're called pre-tribbers. Many Baptists are historically pre-trib. You have the other school of thought, which is that Jesus will not come at the beginning of the tribulation. He's going to come at the end of the tribulation and that the church will be here during the tribulation. They're called post-tribbers. And you have other positions and points of view, but for our purposes, we'll just talk about these. So if you're over here, and by the way, you can't be dogmatic about either one. Way, way too many Christian, conservative scholars for hundreds and hundreds of years have studied and debated, and they're split right down the middle. And it would be short-sighted to say, my way is the only way. Because your way, whether you sit in this chair or this chair, is simply based on an interpretation of scripture that is not clear. But let's just say that you guys over here who are the pre-tribbers are right. Then before or immediately following the battle between Gog and Magog and Israel and God miraculously intervening, smiting them and Israel winning, if you are a pre-trib rapture person, Jesus is coming again to take the church and you're gonna be in heaven during all this stuff. And you're gonna be having the wedding supper of the lamb and you know, all the great things that are gonna be going on. And then in seven years, you get to come back with Jesus and clean up the mess, okay? Now, that's a position that, that's a good position. It's a fine position to have. It's not my position. 
my position, and it doesn't need to be your position, I'm not telling you what to think, I'm telling you what I think and I'm telling you why. My position is, is that we're gonna be here during the tribulation and that Jesus is gonna come again at the end of the tribulation and his feet will touch down on, guess what? The Mount of Olives. And then he'll clean up the mess with us and the armies of heaven in tow. Now, if I'm wrong, oh, I hope I am. Jesus comes again, we're all in heaven. And you're like, Pastor Rick, you were wrong. We're up here, they're down there. And I'll be like, thank God. And God will be like, you're welcome because he'll be right there. It'll be great, right? I'll be apologetic. And, but, but I'm more of this perspective, both from a practical point of view and I do believe that scripture leans that way. But I feel like that we have the obligation and responsibility to be prepared. And friends, you and I are unprepared. Our church in America is lazy and complacent and lackadaisical. And we friends are not prepared. So what happens? Well, first this battle, then God miraculously, supernaturally allows Israel to win yet another battle. And the Antichrist comes on the screen or the scene. Could be a movie, has been a movie. He comes on the scene. The Antichrist comes with two friends. He comes with a high priest of evil and the red dragon, Satan himself, the holy or unholy Trinity. The Antichrist will come with negotiation, with diplomacy, everyone will be sucked into his schemes. The temple will be rebuilt in Jerusalem. Sacrifices, the Jewish people will begin to make sacrifices again in the temple. Now, who in the world would wanna make sacrifices again? But do you know that they're talking about it? I researched this, not from what Christians say about Jewish people, but from what Jewish people say about themselves, they're talking about it. Why would you wanna start killing animals again? He's gonna make a treaty with Israel for three and a half years and everything's gonna look great. But at three and a half years, something happens. The abomination of desecration or desolation or something like that. I'm doing this without notes and from memory. So forgive me. Where the Antichrist reveals who he is and tells the Jews no longer do we have a treaty. Some of the Jews have become believers by then Two martyrs come on the scene, Christian martyrs. Nobody knows who they are. Some think Moses and Elijah because the miracles these martyrs are going to be able to do, turning water into to blood and calling down fire from heaven like Elijah did. Some think it's Elijah and Enoch because of the way they died or didn't. Some think it's just two people that God supernaturally empowers. But at the beginning of this three and a half year revelation of who the Antichrist is and, and an evil rule of Satan and of the high priest, um, these martyrs are killed. At some point, their bodies are left in the street for three and a half days, miraculously resurrected as a sign for God's power, his strength. Everybody will be required to take the mark of the beast a mark either on your forehead or on your right hand. And the mark of the beast is far beyond some kind of an economic transaction sort of a procedure. It's literally a day of reckoning or choosing where every person on the face of the earth will have to either choose to get the mark of the beast, which rejects Christianity and Christ and embraces the worship of the antichrist or they won't be able to do business. Many, the Bible says, will be killed for their faith. And if that wasn't enough, the Bible says that Christians and non-Christians will be judged by whether or not they have taken the mark or not. And things continue to get worse. Many Jews come to Christ. At some point, the Christians who have accepted Christ during the tribulation scatter and hide because the birth pains have become so unbearable that if Jesus didn't do something fast, the world would be crushed. So the Bible says that Jesus comes finally at the end of this seven year period, his feet touch down on the Mount of Olives with the army of heaven 
gathering those Christians who will fight. And the Antichrist and his armies of the world begin to march against Jesus. The battle of Armageddon. And God miraculously intervenes. Jesus wins. The people alive during the tribulation are judged. Satan is thrown into a bottomless pit. Jesus Christ establishes his thousand year reign on earth. Guess where? Jerusalem. The Antichrist ruled in Jerusalem. Everything changed in Jerusalem. Jesus reclaims Jerusalem. And Jesus for a thousand years uses Jerusalem as the capital where us, all of us, will go and we'll worship. And the interesting thing is, it's just seven years away. Perhaps, what were you doing seven years ago? Do you even remember what you were doing seven years ago? Seven years ago, I was on this stage preaching in view of a call, getting called here to be your pastor. It went by just like that. I mean, just so fast. What if, what if we're in the last days? More specifically, what if we're in the end times? But even more specifically, what if we are on the verge or the brink of the great tribulation? What if you are perhaps days away or arguably seven years away from seeing Jesus face to face? Does that freak you out a little bit? I told you it was gonna be a lot today. Does it scare you a little bit? But it excites me, it energizes me, but it gives me, it fills me with a sense of urgency and intensity that, that I think we desperately have to have. Because it may not be today. If I was a betting man, I would bet that it wasn't. But it has my attention. And anytime something has our attention, we should pay attention and we should lean in. So what in the world does this mean to me and to you? First of all, it means that your decision that you have made about Jesus Christ is the most important decision that you could ever make. And more specifically, if you have not made a decision to follow Jesus Christ, I love you, but time could be running out. It may be time to stop playing games. Number two, we have to have a sense of intentionality and urgency with the people closest to us that oftentimes are the easiest to ignore, making sure that they are ready and they are prepared. And I don't mean lobbing truth grenades through your email or your text message or through your phone but I mean through the relationships that you and I should have been establishing all along where we're able to nudge the people in our lives toward Jesus because they listen to us. They don't respond to fear, to hellfire, to brimstone. They respond to seeing Jesus in us. And God holds us most responsible for the people who are closest to us. I also think about the people who are within our sphere of influence who we seem to ignore so well on a regular basis. If we're at the end of the world as we know it, what more cruel, unchristian thing could we possibly do than to ignore people who we know could be days away from hell? Now, I don't know. Is it today? Is it in a thousand years? You don't know. If you think you know, you're arguing with scripture because scripture says no one knows, but it has my attention. And the fourth thing I wanna point you to, not just your personal relationship with Jesus, not just you being responsible for the people closest to you, nudging them toward, toward salvation, not just the people who you see every day, but it reminds me of the importance of the church. Because friends, if we don't go through the tribulation, the church is vitally important. But if we do go through the tribulation, you cannot live without the church. Literally, 
when the Bible says, do not forsake the assembling of the saints as some are in the habit of doing, it literally is giving us a warning. It's not so that we can come and consume when we want to and not be involved when we don't, but the church is Jesus' choice for the redemption of a lost world until time runs out. And the Bible says Jesus has not come again, not because he's ignoring us or doesn't care, but because he's being patient, not wanting anybody to perish, but to have a right relationship with him. And friends, not only does the church need to maintain its witness, there could be a time, and it may not be far off, when we have to have each other to survive. Now, that sounds very bleak. It sounds very ominous. And that's not my personality, nor is it my perspective. I'm an optimist. And do you remember in Matthew 24, when Pastor Dan read that passage, Jesus said, these things are coming. The disciples are like, yep, we've seen them. He goes, no, the birth pains are just starting. This might even be a Braxton Hicks contraction. It's coming. No epidurals, get ready. But don't be alarmed because I'm in control. Don't be alarmed because I love you. Don't be alarmed because I'm coming for you. And at the end of the thousand year reign of Jesus here on earth, Satan is going to be released from his pit for a brief period of time. One final brief battle where he's cast into the lake of fire. And you and I, we begin our eternal state where the pain, the sadness, the sin, the weakness, the disillusionment, the disappointment, the junk we deal with in this world isn't even a distant memory. You friends can be, we will be at home with the Lord. So I say, come Jesus, come, come on. But until then, what are you gonna do? Father, thank you so much for my friends. And I pray that we would take this message seriously, that we wouldn't be so afraid that we're paralyzed or believe the world is coming to an end and the sky is falling and become pessimistic and jaded and negative, that we wouldn't be so excited and happy that we're right and everyone else is wrong, that we just wanna stand back with our arms folded watching things unfold. For whatever reason, Jesus came to begin what we call the church, a group of believers, followers, living life a different way in the middle of a world that's a dark place and becoming darker. And I pray, Father, that as we as individuals and as a group grow, grow closer to you, becoming more faithful followers, more devout, more committed, that people would see your strength even in the middle of our weakness. I pray that before we leave today, that we each have our own personal salvation secured. We've made the decision to confess our sin, to believe who Jesus Christ is, and to decide to follow you and follow you with our lives. That we would look around us to the person we wake up next to or the people we see at the dinner table or take to the bus the ones who we text the most, the ones who we see when we get to the office, that we would commit to you to be faithful through relationship and influence, through love, through service, sharing the truth of the gospel in an urgent time like this, that we would be committed to your church, Father. We wouldn't play games anymore. We wouldn't be lackadaisical and quasi-committed, that we would be all in preparing, getting ready, being involved in your redemptive plan. And I ask these things and pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.